Okay. Hello. I'm Jan Leitman. Hi, I'm Gayatri from Menon. Welcome. Welcome to Med Newsweek Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine's Global Leaders. Today, today we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. John Green. Dr. Green is the Section Chief of Infectious Disease and Epidemiology and the Chief Epidemiologist, along with a professor in the Department of Oncological Sciences and a professor in medicine in infectious diseases at Moffitt Cancer Center. In today's presentation, Dr. Green discusses the most recent developments of COVID-19 in cancer patients. Did you know, did you know that Dr. Green has been recognized amongst the best doctors in America and recognized as an outstanding teacher of the year by the Florida American College of Physicians and honored with Moffitt Angel Award by his patients? A true global leader in the field of infectious diseases. So, Let's tune in and learn from this global pioneer. The COVID-19 has a spike on it, which you can see here. It looks like a crown and it has all these spikes, the spike protein. And this attaches to our cells by the ACE2 receptor. And going after that target, we focus in there. And here we are binding to the spike protein, trying to prevent infection and infecting other cells by antibody and medications. And that's uh, going to be key to the future of treatment of COVID as well as the prevention. And as you well know, we've had uh, our fourth wave going on now. The first was our wild type, then the alpha strain, which originated in the UK, and then the delta strain originated in India. And now the Omicron strain just reported in South Africa and noted to be in worldwide and has taken over. Now, what is unique about Omicron compelled to, compared to delta is it can infect um, three times more in people than the Delta strain and the mutations that have occurred are much more than Delta, at least 50 mutations. And the scary thing is, is that on the very spike protein at the top where the red dots are on the right, you can see that it has changed the spike protein, therefore making it more efficient at evading our immunity. Fortunately, it's not a severe illness. It's actually less severe. However, it's more contagious. Fortunately, also, we all are experienced with exceptions of a few states, a decrease in the Omicron COVID-19 uh, fourth wave, and we're expected to continue to decline. And as Dr. Fauci and others have told us is that we are now in the deceleration phase of our pandemic. We're heading towards endemic or control, and we will never have elimination. So this will be an annual event and eradication is impossible because it's found in animals as well as in humans. The people that are most uh, susceptible to uh, severe illness and death are the older you are, the worse it is. And then with comorbid illnesses, including heart, lung, diabetes, hypertension, and notice cancer is on their list, and so is obesity. The risk of dying of COVID-19 is estimated at one in 150 chances for all ages, which is more likely to occur than heart, a death by heart disease or cancer or stroke, and much more common to die from COVID than from the flu or pneumonia. However, age is very important because if you're 10 years old, it's much less chance and then a big jump when you're 25 year old to from one in 50 to one in 10,000 chance. Now the risk factors of a bad outcome are high inoculum, poor immunity, genetics plays a role. You may be more susceptible to infection and severe illness, male, is a worse outcome than females, comorbidities, and older age. So here's some important points from the latest literature. Omicron is less severe hospitalization 
illness left, length of stay in the hospital is less than the alpha and the delta. Here's a JAMA article showing you the fourth wave over at the right. And if you look at the bottom, you can see you're less likely to be on oxygen if admitted on the ventilator or in the ICU and to die of Omicron. But because the Omicron numbers are so high, it may exceed the Delta wave in numbers, but not per person. Here's a study from South Africa showing us the first evidence that it was less severe. Uh, notice that it was affecting females uh, more than uh, males with uh, the Omicron versus the Alpha, and the African American population was more likely than the Alpha variant. And then the risk of being admitted to the hospital was less with Omicron. Length of stay was three versus five days and severe illness much less. And then from the uh, South Africa data, the spike, the fourth one you can see is uh, less likely to die of Omicron compared to Delta per patient. And there was the publication that told us about this. And another uh, point that was made in California, looking at Omicron down at the bottom, you can see that the Omicron had reduced severity compared to Delta and less hospital stay. And then when you look at Omicron compared to Delta, the uh, green versus the purple, you had green Omicron, less chance of being um, hospitalized on a ventilator and dying than Delta and you had less hospital stay, you were discharged a lot sooner uh, than uh, with Omicron than with Delta. Omicron has greater immune evasion and breakthrough after vaccination than Delta. Notice Omicron after vaccination two doses had a higher uh, infection um, than Delta and after uh, the immune system wanes over time, it becomes more apparent. So the conclusion is that you should get a third dose if you're immune suppressed because your immunity wanes. And that's even more important because Omicron needs a higher antibody titer immune response than Delta, which is better at immune evasion. Who should get this vaccination, third vaccination? Well, according to the American Society of Hematology, active treatment, hematologic malignancy, and transplant and solid tumor patients on active treatment. We also know that Moderna has three times a larger dose than the Pfizer with less breakthrough infections and more local side effects. So it's a more potent and it has more potential side effects. However, most people view these two messenger RNA vaccines as equivalent. Here you can see breakthrough infections with Pfizer at the over time more common with the Delta um, variant peak than the Moderna. And here you can see that of these different um, peaks here, that the less at the bottom was Moderna, then Pfizer, then the Johnson & Johnson, and the Delta was more contagious than the Alpha in blue. If you look at, again, the three comparisons, you can see less breakthrough infections with Moderna, then Pfizer, then the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus vector vaccine. And of course, more side effects, the redness with Moderna is more apparent, not seen with Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson. However, it's self-limited and is not as um, common, but it does occur. Natural immunity is quite protective from reinfection. And uh, it's similar to, uh, very similar to vaccination immunity. And if you have both, which is natural infection followed by vaccination, the chance of getting infected again is your best immunity. And here are the graphs showing you that no vaccination, high infection rate at the top, way down at the bottom, all those vaccinated and those natural immunity and natural immunity with vaccination have the lowest infection rate. The immune response to infection or vaccination in healthy people, not only do you have a brisk antibody level, which wanes in three to 
12 months, depending on how you've acquired it, your own immune system, but you have a cellular immunity with memory cells. That's called your amnestic response, which means months, months later, sometimes years with certain viruses, you can actually mount an immune response even though your antibody is low, low or undetectable. And that's because there's two components to your immune response. Now, whether you're infected or vaccinated, you either have a rapid decay and you have a loss of immune protection or you're a sustainer and you have a prolonged immune protection. And you can see that patients, some of them that are sustainers have a stronger immunity and are protected against reinfection or the first infection after vaccination. You could be a rapid waning person over time, a slow waner, you can persist, which is great, or you could even have a delayed response. So there's many responses to vaccination. The bottom line is over time, you lose that immunity. And that's why the boosters were recommended in third and fourth doses for immune suppressed because they cannot mount an immune response. In fact, um, after Delta, it was found that the vaccinated had an eightfold less risk of disease, hospitalization, 25-fold and 25-fold less risk of death after vaccination than the unvaccinated. Employees working at hospitals were infected, mostly not vaccinated, then partially vaccinated and fully vaccinated. In the Delta and the Omicron, we had significant hospital um, employees infected that are immune competent despite getting the vaccine because the Omicron was able to evade immune system. Adolescents vaccinated 12 to 18, less likely to be uh, infected uh, than unvaccinated with a 97% reduction in infection, but they're more likely to have potential males in their teens, 20s myocarditis from the vaccine as well as the infection. Now, if your family is vaccinated, the more members in your family, the less risk you are to get infected. So our cancer patients should have a wall of vaccinated family members around them protecting them. And just to summarize, the Moderna 93% effective for Delta, 88% Pfizer, and 71% for J&J. &J. What about the immune response to infection or vaccination in cancer patients? Well, we know that uh, the moderate severely immune suppressed cancer patients are heme patients, transplant, HIV, and uh, people on active treatment, including steroids and different immunotherapies. We find that the immune suppressed, instead of being in the 90 percentile or anywhere from 59 to 80 percent after two doses for Delta. And you can see with time, the antibody levels and the immune protection falls in the immune suppressed. Notice that the lowest immune response after vaccination is solid tumor, heme cancers, as opposed to solid tumors and HIV with normal immune system are close, close to healthy. And notice again that at the bottom, the heme malignancy and the solid organ transplants have the lowest immune response. And of the heme malignancy, chronic lymphocytic leukemia is one of the lowest immune response. If you look at transplants down at the bottom, if you're on active treatment to prevent rejection or graft versus you have a lower immune response. All of this is very logical, intuitive. Notice your immune response after the third dose is quite brisk as opposed to the first and second. So those immune suppressed people were getting three doses and even potentially a fourth, five months later, a booster. And you can see that your antibody response is best if you have, for example, a cancer and you're watchful waiting. And if you're in remission, you have a good response. And if you have active treatment, you have the least response. And if you got a monoclonal antibody, you have less response because of your own, the antibody that was given to you. Another cancer that's in the heme malignancy family is myeloma. They have a low antibody response, similar to the myelogenous leukemias. And you can see at the bottom, the seroconversion rate with myelomas was 78% versus 100% for elderly controls. 
And then looking at myeloma, you can see those that are older have the less immune response and those that are on active treatment, low lymphocytes and neutrophils. And again, looking at multiple myeloma, the immune response is not as brisk as a healthy control. And the older you are, the less a brisk it will be. So CLL myeloma, and remember CLL's immune responses are low, not 90, they're in the 40%, but they're better after a third dose and a booster. And they're the least if they were on active treatment. So we try to do it when they're not on active treatment and get it early when you're in remission or not on treatment. And then notice compared to the right upper healthy immune response, CLL patients, many of them have no response or very poor, especially in the right lower corner, very low response. So CLL patients may not mount an immune response and they'd be great candidates for the Evusheld immunotherapy or excuse me, monoclonal antibody to give them artificial immunity, especially when they don't respond to three doses of vaccination. So on therapy, worst, off therapy, better immune response. Now, if you get rituxin for lymphoma CLLs, your immune response is terrible uh, for six months. You would have to wait if you get vaccinated and then get an immune response, and then you get rituxin, your immune response is sustained there. So what about solid tumor patients? Look at the bottom there. If you are on active treatment, solid tumor patients should get three doses as well of the vaccine. And who's gonna have a breakthrough infection fully vaccinated? It will be more of the solid organ tumors, the bone marrow transplant are gonna have the least immune response and Evusheld may be a good monoclonal antibody to give them artificial antibody protection. And those that aren't as immune suppressed, they have an excellent vaccine efficacy after the third dose up to 88% compared to 97% with controls. How long are COVID infected cancer patients contagious? Well, um, most people are not contagious after 10 days if they're immune competent, 20 days if they're immune suppressed cancer patients, solid tumor, but there's always a few patients with lymphomas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, myelomas, who can shed, in this case, two months active viable virus as long as 60 days out. One patient shed all the way out to 105 days active virus with chronic lymphocytic leukemia with low antibody or hypogamma globulinemia. Another patient who had a relapse of infection where it required multiple treatments was shedding viable virus up to 300 plus one year out. And this patient here shed virus with lymphoma as long as 131 days, reinfected, requiring treatment twice because of poor immune response. What kind of lab is best to use? Well, we have the fact that virus is found in the nasopharynx and the lung sputum, the throat and the urine, but not really um, detectable there. That's not been used. Vaginal swabs, not there. Blood, not too good. Stool, yes, but not a good specimen there. So we have home health kits where people are testing and they can pick up the virus if it's in high viral load, but if it's a low viral amount, they will be falsely negative. And it looks like a pregnancy test with those little lines, control versus your test. However, um, one in three people can misinterpret their COVID test thinking it's positive when it's the control. So you have to read the directions. Uh, PCR nasopharynx is the gold standard in our hospital and most others, as opposed to just the nose or the throat or the saliva. And it's quite accurate. Negative positives are usually very easy to determine, whereas a negative home test antigen may be a false negative. And then antibody test is used after the fact to see if you mount an immune response, but is not routinely recommended. Now, what kind of mitigation measures can you do or have been done to reduce your risk of uh, 
exposure and thus infection and what adverse effects have that had. So wearing a mask around others is important. The best quality mask is a N95 number 14. Number two is a surgical mask. And then the least effective is number 12, the gaiters, and then everything in between. Double masking may be more protection, but harder to breathe. But with masks come mask fatigue and they don't work unless you use them correctly. And we have all seen them used all over the place with no protection or minimal. And remember breathing for 50 minutes with someone without mask can cause an infection versus a cough in the face versus talking for five minutes. So exposures can vary and wearing a mask, everybody around you is the least likely to transmit infection. What about touching things? Only one in 300 cases are from you touching something and then touching your mouth or face. And even though it can grow up to seven days in surgical so certain locations, this has not been a big problem with spread, even though you should continue to wash your hands. You don't need to change your clothes when you come to the hospital or work in a hospital because it's not going to infect you from clothing. So that whole trend was completely unnecessary. Also frequent testing is done prior to procedures. It's questionable whether it's necessary for schools and colleges to do it frequently, but it's reasonable during high epidemic threshold numbers where they're doing it frequently, but it can be quite burdensome. Now, if you look at, for example, healthcare workers at MD Anderson, they found that when an employee tested positive from a hospital transmission, over at the left-hand corner, it occurred in a small break room where people are eating and talking with poor ventilation. And if you're walk, taking care of patients all day long with COVID-19 wearing your proper equipment, your risk of catching COVID is very close to zero. So most 99% uh, of all employees at Moffitt and other hospitals are infected in the community in their own home and the environment, not in the hospital. The hospital is safe to come to. And in your household, if you have lots of people living in a crowded, poorly, poorly ventilated area, that could be a problem, which could be a problem for household transmission, and it may be disproportionately uh, found in those that are minorities. Now, restricting visitors will reduce potential spread, but it also is very detrimental to the patient, so we avoid this as much as possible. A lot of our measures have been quite uh, draconian, and a lot of states have enacted countermeasures to keep from strict lockdowns. And that has been a battle between public health and the general community's freedom of choice. In fact, uh, one article made by economics uh, people have shown that lockdowns prevented 0.2% of COVID and had major disruption of society and the economy. It also uh, affects um, kids having more myopia and from screen time and also mental health decline from lockdowns and unable to go to school and sitting in front of a computer screen all the time. Drug use and mental health uh, were seriously hampered during the COVID lockdown periods. What is the risk of severe disease and mortality in cancer patients? Well, we know Cancer patients in multiple studies have worse outcome than people without cancer. And looking at different cancer types is important as this study demonstrates from Lancet. Down at the bottom, those that are the worst prognosis are going to be the heme malignancy, which is lymphomas, leukemias, myelomas. So those are the big three there. And then also at the top, males and older age. Now, if we look at certain groups such as CLL with COVID down at the bottom, uh, you can, or excuse me, uh, and the second down, the older you are, the worse your outcome, diabetes, uh, smoking, and on treatment may get you a higher risk of a bad outcome. They looked at all the treatment for CLL patients, including all these drugs listed here, 
And the only worse outcome was pretty much age and those that were already sick with a high complicated illness score at the top, as you can see, deviated from uh, the relatively healthier uh, COL patients. Uh, another uh, heme malignancy study from Italy came out and it looked at mortality higher the older you were, which is a, a well-known event, whether you have cancer or not. And then if you look at the type of heme malignancies, uh, it included a variety of leukemias and um, uh, myeloma plasma cell dyscrasias. And then you can see that um, when you compared the different cancers with worse outcomes, notice leukemia stands out. And then when you look at um, those, uh, those that had a worse outcome, again, you can see leukemia is definitely standing out from the pack. Now, if you look at those that are, for example, African-American, they had a worse outcome with colon, breast, and prostate cancer being the most common with COVID-19 compared to controls. Now, if you look at uh, those with cancer versus without cancer and those with COVID without COVID, African-Americans fared, fared worse than whites in all categories, especially COVID and cancer. If you look at myeloma patients, for example, those that had low immunity and uh, IgG levels may have a worse outcome. And uh, this was um, apparent with hypertension and uh, also African-American had a worse outcome as well as Hispanics with myeloma. And when you look at, for example, lymphoma getting B cell depleted treatments such as rituxans, they have a worse outcome. What about the clinical presentation of patients with COVID-19? Well, initially they have the high immune response viral load that slowly comes down, the immune system kicks in, and now they have a over exuberant hyperinflammatory phase where they can deteriorate and get progressively worse or better. So we have three different stages that can occur during this uh, illness. And if you notice that initially we have the um, early onset in the first few days where the virus is replicating, then the lungs are affected later on in the later part of the week and then into the second week through the bloodstream and multi-organ dysfunction. And then by three weeks, we're in a crucial period of whether we can turn the corner after all of our intervention. One of the most interesting and unusual things that was found in COVID than other viruses was affecting your olfactory center and the part of your brain that has taste and smell. And it found out that uh, one study found that the actual olfactory uh, nerve cells themselves were not affected, but what was affected was the cells that support and feed your olfactory nerves. And those cells have names such as the pericyte and sustentacular cell and basal cells are affected, which make you lose smell and taste. You can rarely have rashes that look like poor circulation, like vasculitis with small vessel clot formation, so hypercoagulable. Levito reticularis, a uneven uh, distribution of blood flow because of this vasoconstriction. The purple, dark looking red toes, almost like you have chill blains or frostbite from the blood flow. Again, not common, but interesting. Some people even had some ulcers in the mouth, mucositis, and that again is rare, but interesting. Ulcerations in the penile genital area, as well as the mouth in one person with some lesions and rashes, sometimes quite severe with mucositis as if you got chemotherapy. What are some radiological findings of COVID-19 and are they different than the flu? Well, you can't tell them apart with diffuse white out when you're full-blown adult respiratory distress syndrome. And when we looked at CT findings, what were unique is these circular round ground glass areas 
are very consistent with COVID versus other viruses. When it gets severe white out uh, as this, you can't really tell them apart. The other thing is interesting about COVID is it can cause these ground glass areas that are peripheral near the pleura. That's unique pretty much for COVID. And then of course, just like with any infection, rarely you can get a gas in your lung called a pneumothorax, pleural space, or in your mediastinum and your outcome is very bad when that occurs. And then your pulmonary function test, ability to take deep breaths and breathe through a machine are restricted six to 12 months out, but fortunately resolves in the vast majority of people after three to six months. This was an interesting study that found if you presented on the left with the pleural based ground glass, you had a good prognosis. If you were on the far right with diffuse ground glass, you had a worse prognosis. And then a mild scattered in between multifocal pattern was a medium prognosis. So that was an interesting uh, finding trying to correlate with prognosis. Why do some patients get blood clots with COVID-19? And the answer is that um, they are hypercoagulable. And why are they hypercoagulable is a good question. So when we think of, say, heart attacks are increased after flu and COVID-19, but much more likely with COVID-19 to have a heart attack because of increased coagulability and already reduced blood flow in some people. Strokes are more common. You are more likely to have autoantibodies, including lupus anticoagulant. You um, can also have arterial thrombosis as well as pulmonary emboli and deep vein thrombosis. And anticoagulation is mainstay during people hospitalized and may be used a longer duration after discharge. Severe clots, including a saddle emboli with right heart failure have been reported. And they were discussing how long blood anticoagulation should last. Here's some examples of a big clot in the uh, saddle area of your pulmonary arteries, as you can see here, highly high mortality with that. People that have died have found clots in their lungs. And to your brain, clots to the brain, strokes are also increased, and heart attacks. So anywhere blood flow that's crucial can have problems, heart, brain, and clots to the lungs. These are the saddle emboli that have been pulled out of people. Here is a clot down at the left corner in the aorta. And here's all the autoantibodies promoting the hypercoagulable state. And you can see ARDS, DIC, heart attacks, pneumothorax, and uh, kidney liver failure increase with COVID-19. What are the unique pathology findings of COVID-19? Here's an example of looking at people's lungs. What do you see under the microscope? Proteinaceous exudates filling the alveoli, organizing pneumonia with multinucleated giant cells and fibrin and fibroblast balls of like scarring down with inflammation later on. And the heart, when people die and have myocarditis, the heart is also affected with uh, poor blood flow to the heart, damage to the heart muscles and clot formation. What about uh, infections occurring in hospitalized COVID patients? Bacterial infections are rare in the first week to 10 days, if they wind up on a ventilator in the ICU, now you can see gram negative rods, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, E. coli. You don't need antibiotics early on, but you may need them after they're ill enough and they're progressively getting worse and it looks like a bacteria is developing. So nosocomial hospital acquired infections, 918 cases analyzed and notice the bacteria were mostly Staph, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and some Klebsiella E. coli, and occasionally the molds, Mucor, which was prominent in India. Aspergillus is the more common mold that we see in others, which is following the flu and also can follow COVID at a higher rate. 
So here's some cases of Aspergillus and even down at the bottom, Rhizopus, the mucor family. And here's what the molds look like in the lungs with high mortality, which we know occurs with the flu, but higher risk with COVID-19. What about COVID treatment? Well, we primarily use remdesivir to prevent uh, hospitalization if you have mild symptoms for three days, or we give it to you five days if you're in the hospital. We used to give you the Regeneron monoclonal antibody, but it doesn't work for Omicron, so we give you Sotrovimab. And who do we give this to? Those that are immune suppressed defined on the left, which we've been pretty much covering this whole talk. Here's a great uh, example of what treatment you can get. Well, the vaccination early on is the key to get immunity. If you don't mount an immune response and you've got three doses, you can get Evusheld if you're immune suppressed team malignancy. And then if you have mild to moderate symptoms, you can get the remdesivir. And then if you can get it, which is short supply, Paxlovid and Molnupravir oral therapy. The Sotrivimab is the monoclonal antibody, if you can get it, that is effective against Omicron. The two above it, the uh, bam Eddy and the Kazi md are not effective against Omicron. And once you're in the hospital, other drugs are baricitinib and Tosi. We can use in addition to Decadron and Remdesivir. What about surgery timing in COVID infected patients? What should I do there? Well, if you need um, a minor surgery, you should delay it for several weeks after COVID because you'll have a worse outcome. And if you need an emergency surgery, it's even worse outcome in men more than women. If you look at surgery and COVID, it's a bad mix because your body goes into a healing stage and you're in a hyperinflammatory stage. You're at risk for blood clots and organ failure if you have surgery right away, unless it's an emergency. So the surgeons and anesthesia docs recommend four weeks delay if you had no symptoms or mild illness, six weeks if you had a more severe illness, eight to 10 weeks if you're very immune suppressed and you were hospitalized, and up to 12 weeks if you were in the ICU. These are for elective surgery. Of course, you can get surgery at any time if it's emergent. What happens after a COVID infection? Well, some people can actually have symptoms three, six months later. The post-COVID symptoms for most can last up to 60 days. Fatigue, short of breath, loss of smell, runny nose, sore throat, tired, muscle aches. And uh, you can see two out of three People had uh, symptoms for one to six months after diagnosis, mostly chest, throat pain, shortness of breath, cough, and fatigue. And then notice neurologically, difficulty concentrating, memory deficits, cognitive impairment, smell problems, depression, sleep problems, anxiety, uh, functionally impaired, decreased exercise tolerance, and oxygenation is potentially down. The worse illness you have, the longer your recovery. And then these are a smattering of things that have occurred in people coming to COVID clinics four months later, including, including cognitive impairment, problems breathing, and psychiatric symptoms. Uh, notice that uh, compared to a respiratory tract infection, other than COVID, COVID is more likely to have a uh, worse outcome uh, for strokes, neurologic problems, dementia, mood anxiety, psychoses, muscle disease. So if you have a lot more neurologic problems after COVID than other respiratory viruses. In fact, compared to flu and respiratory viruses, COVID is more likely to be associated with a longer recovery from all kinds of mood, anxiety, uh, insomnia, and other neurologic phenomena listed there. Now, if you do have a COVID clinic in your area, a multidisciplinary approach with an internist, a kidney doctor, a hematologist, a pulmonologist, and a neuropsych uh, doctor can help in all those areas depending on where the main symptom is. And then finally, um, one syndrome that was unique to COVID-19 
was a, a multi-inflammatory systemic problem in C children and A adults, Miss C and Miss A. And this was causing a massive pro-inflammatory response that was giving a syndrome similar to the disease Kawasaki's disease with prolonged illnesses and slow recovery. And way after the virus is cleared, the immune system is attacking the body, causing organ dysfunction and sometimes even death. So this has been a unusual uh, phenomenon, fortunately rare, and it's a massive inflammatory response uh, with high cytokine levels and immune response out of proportion uh, way after the acute event is over. 